Dr. Allison Ventura is an associate professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Public Health at California Polytech State University. She's also the director of the Cal Poly Healthy Kids Labs and associate director of research training and fellowship for Cal Poly Center for Research uh, Health Research. For the past decade, Dr. Ventura's research has primarily focused on infant feeding interactions and understanding how these interactions affect the development and dietary preferences, eating behaviors, and growth trajectories during infancy and early childhood. She's particularly interested in the bi-directional influences between parents and children. That is, how parents' beliefs and practices affect children's behavior and development, as well as how children's characteristics and behaviors affect parents' beliefs and practices. Much of Dr. Ventura's recent work focuses on the promotion of responsive feeding during breastfeeding, bottle feeding, and the introduction to complementary foods and beverages. And I want to say I'm really excited about um, Dr. Ventura's uh, work. She uses um, some of the PCI scales and some of her studies to understand the dyadic relationship, and they're just really innovative. Um, she's really uh, got a great, exciting research program. So I believe this will be um, really wonderful for all of you to get a chance to learn about that. So with that, Dr. Ventura, I'd like to turn it over to you if you want to share your slides. And I'm going to mute myself. So welcome. And welcome to all of you. Yay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for such a nice introduction, Monica. Um, can you all see my slides okay? Is, that, is everything look good? Thumbs up? Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just so thrilled to be here. This is such a wonderful opportunity to get to connect with um, all of you through this lecture series and, um, and you know, hopefully inform some of the work that you do. So I'm really pleased to be able to share the research that we've been doing on promoting responsive feeding within the particular context of bottle feeding to reduce overfeeding and prevent rapid weight gain during infancy. So to give you an overview of what we'll discuss today, I first want to emphasize the importance of responsive feeding, define this term for you, and just give you a sense of you know, what it looks like and, and why this is a, an important goal for feeding interactions. Then we'll think about uh, the primary ways that babies are fed, breasts versus bottles, and think about um, what's the difference between these two modes of feeding and what implications might that have for promoting responsive feeding. We'll then think about this idea of promoting responsive bottle feeding uh, and how we can do that to uh, support healthy eating behaviors and growth trajectories during childhood. And then we'll think about what's what's baby got to do with it. So how do how do babies kind of what do they bring to the table during these feeding interactions and how can we consider that in our tailored intervention approaches that we do with families. So I think uh, given where you all are coming from and what I saw in the chat in terms of your positions, you are probably all well aware of the importance of the first thousand days that we consider this a sensitive period of development. Um, and we define the first 1000 days as the window between conception and the child's second birthday. We know that the experiences and exposures that occur during this period have a disproportionate and lasting effect on later health outcomes. So again, I, I think you're all well aware of this, but, but we know that, um, the, that this is really a foundational period where organ systems and the brain are going through such rapid development that this is such a ripe time for intervention because we know that we can get all a bang for our buck during this period, right? That, that the support we can give to families to support healthy development really does establish a foundation of health for children. And, I'm guessing many of you think about this daily in terms of social emotional and cognitive uh, development, but I did just want to highlight that we see this in terms of physical growth as well and, and risk for obesity. Uh, and in particular, infancy is a time of rapid adipogenesis, which means accumulation of, of fat mass. We know that this starts uh, in utero, that this is when we first develop our fat cells and we see the greatest increases in adiposity or, or fat cells uh, during the third trimester when the fetus is really you know, growing in size once all the foundational work has been done on the organs. Uh, but then 
during infancy, we see a really striking increase in the percent body fat. And uh, any of us who know infants have probably seen this anecdotally, right? That infants are born kind of scrawny and then they really plump up over those first couple months. And that's what, what you're seeing is that they're really, uh, this adipogenesis is going on to, to um, increase their percent body fat to support growth. And I just wanna contrast um, these striking increases that you see in early infancy with the rest of the lifespan through adolescence that uh, the, the rate of uh, a fat accrual really slows down quite a bit and um, never really reaches the same level of, of increase. And so we know that you know, much like what we think about with, with other domains of development, this means that this is a time when there's a lot of programming going on and that the influences on uh, weight gain and, and body fat accrual during this time have lasting impacts. And in particular, there's been um, a lot of research done over the past uh, few decades showing that rapid infant weight gain very strong predictor of later obesity. And so these are some data from one metal analysis uh, that was conducted in 2018 that showed that rapid weight gain, which we can define as weight for age Z score change above 0.67. And this um, conceptually equates to crossing percentile lines. So if, if a baby shows an upward crossing of percentile lines on growth charts, this predicts a uh, over threefold increase in their risk for later obesity during later childhood and adolescence. So, um, you know, this is part of why we monitor growth, why we look at whether babies are crossing percentile lines, because this can be a really important early marker of that baby uh, gaining weight too quickly and increasing risk for obesity. So, this means that our early feeding interactions are a really important target for prevention efforts. We know that feeding is one of the most proximal influences on a baby's rate of weight gain. And so we wanna make sure that we are really supporting families during these early feeding interactions so that we can support the development of healthy eating behaviors, abilities to self-regulate intake and, and promote healthy growth trajectories because these, these early feeding actions, interactions are so central to promoting uh, appropriate rates of weight gain. And um, I've always really liked this model that DeSantis and colleagues proposed in their review of uh, the role of responsive feeding and overweight. Uh, and I think it nicely incorporates a lot of the um, concepts that we see in the, the NCAS tools as well. I, I, you know, I, I saw a lot of overlap with um, this when I was learning the, the PCI feeding scales. Um, and so this really highlights, you know, the, the dyadic nature of these feeding interactions and that both caregivers and infants bring something to the table and are an important contributor to the overall outcome of, of these feeding interactions. And so, you know, obviously we have the broader social environmental context of feeding, the home environment and the culture that might drive feeding practices. But in terms of the caregivers, some of the things that we wanna think about supporting caregivers in doing is being aware of their baby's feeding cues, being able to accurately interpret those cues as, you know, needs to hunger to, to eat or, or stop eating. And, and then um, adopt developmentally appropriate responsive to those cues. The baby also plays a role in their clarity of hunger and satiation cues. They, the infant is really the one signaling the need to eat versus stop eating. And when we have you know, issues on either side um, of this interaction, this can lead to a discordant feeding responsiveness where either you know, the caregiver is misinterpreting cues or um, overfeeding the baby and not attending to these hunger and satiation cues, or perhaps the baby is not signaling clearly needs and, and then um, we have a mismatch between what the baby actually needs and what the caregiver provides. When we have discord, this can lead to increased feeding frequency and amount. And um, as I'll talk about in a minute, when we have a mismatch between you know what the baby's physiology demands and what is actually happening this can impair self-regulatory abilities related to regulation of caloric intake um, this means that that baby might be less able to you know to feel fullness and attend to it and may lead to overfeeding which would ultimately lead to uh, rapid weight gain and later obesity so um, 
So we'll think through this model and, and, you know, as a foundation for thinking about promoting responsive feeding in different feeding contexts. So, as I mentioned, um, this term self-regulation of intake is an important one we're thinking about early feeding interactions because this is really our primary goal, right? We want to develop babies who, you know, turn into children and adults who are really good at eating when they're hungry and stopping when they're full and allowing those physiological cues of hunger and fullness to drive their eating and hopefully help them to manage their uh, their weight in a way that's healthy and um, you know tuned to their physiological needs. So what does this look like during early feeding interactions? Well, first we would want a baby to be able to recognize the physiological feelings associated with hunger, that discomfort that they might feel and, and be able to recognize that as hunger and to express their hunger through uh, hunger cues like gnawing on their, mouthing their, uh, their little fist or rooting. We would then want that hunger cue to be met with feeding or eating. Uh, as the feeding progresses, we would want that baby to recognize the physiological feelings of fullness and then express that through fullness cues. And then we would want the feeding to stop. So we would want a really nice pairing, right, between the physiological feelings, the cues that are expressed, and then the actual uh, starting and stopping of feeding. And um, many Experimental studies over the past couple of decades have shown that young infants have the capacity to self-regulate intake, and it's thought that this is an innate ability that can unfold over time if properly supported by feeding interactions. So these experimental studies have shown that infants can indeed downregulate their breast milk or formula intake, meaning that they, they consume less. Um, in response to various manipulations of the, the milk that's being fed or the amount of milk that's available or the, the composition of the diet. So um, Samuel Fomen back in the um, late 60s and, and 70s showed that if you manipulate the caloric density of the formula, so if you feed babies a, a, a formula that's more calorically dense, they will over time downregulate how much formula they're consuming. So they'll consume less formula so that they can gain at a consistent rate despite being fed a higher calorie formula. In some of the work that we've done, we've shown that if you add free glutamate formula, that babies can downregulate the amount of formula they consume. And free glutamate is a free amino acid, which those are the building blocks of proteins, of dietary proteins. And um, free glutamate is really abundant in breast milk, and it's thought to be a, a property of breast milk that helps really intake and growth. And so we found that if you add it to formula, that it seems to have these satiating properties. And in fact, if infants are fed these high glutamate formulas over a longer period of time, they actually gain weight more like a breastfed baby compared to a, more like a formula fed baby. Uh, Kay Dewey and her colleagues also show that if you increase the supply of breast milk by having moms pump after every breastfeeding, that infants will initially consume a little bit more, but then over time they'll downregulate the amount they consume to eventually consume a consistent amount um, compared to uh, uh, comparable to what they consume prior to the increase in supply. And we also see that um, when solid foods are introduced, breastfed infants are able to downregulate how much breast milk they're consuming to account for the addition of calories from solid foods so that they're ultimately consuming a consistent number of calories. So we have various types of data showing that, you know, infants can do this. They're responsive to what they're being fed and can modify their intake accordingly. And um, this is probably a really important way that they can, you know, maintain healthy growth trajectories. But the one thing I haven't said yet that you're maybe already thinking about is that it's not just the baby here, right? Uh, the, the, the caregiver plays a role in actually starting and stopping in the feeding and, and supporting all of this actually happening. So, uh, so that's where responsive feeding comes in. That this is a really important way to support these developing capacities to self-regulate intake. And so, as I already discussed, you know, we know that infants signal hunger and fullness and their needs for breaks that are aligned with their physiological needs. And so it's really important that 
caregivers are able to be responsive and supportive of um, what these cues mean and being able to match their response to the infant's expressed need. So that means that the caregiver is responsive to these cues and how they initiate, pause, or terminate the feeding, and that this is really aligned to um, the, the infant's cues. So to further define this idea of responsive feeding for you, um, we have a responsive feeding compared to what we would consider not responsive feeding, to just to really illustrate this, the spectrum of how this might look and, and the ideal that we would want to support for caregivers to infants. So responsive feeding, a, a infant it's feeding a baby on demand um, in response to those hunger cues. Uh, in contrast, non-responsive feeding would be feeding on a schedule. So, you know, tending to external cues like the, the amount of time that has passed. We want, res during responsive feeding, the caregiver initiates feeding in response to infant hunger cues and not in response to the time of day or, you know, the availability of food. Uh, we know that the responsive feeder engages with the child during feeding. They recognize that feeding is not just nutrition, but it's a really important time for social emotional growth fostering and cognitive growth fostering. Um, during not responsive feeding, the caregiver may be distracted. They might be on their phone or watching TV the whole time or not engaged with their child. The responsive feeder paces the feeding according to the signals from the child. So they allow for pauses and breaks during the feeding. They don't try to rush through the feeding, but rather they, they pace it in according to what the infant is expressing he or she needs. Um, versus during not responsive feeding, uh, the caregiver might stimulate feeding, you know, try to get the feeding quickly, or try to pursue the child with food, you know, continue the feeding even though the child is expressing a need for a break or, or to be done. Um, there can be some encouragement, especially as we get into you know, solid foods that the, the caregiver can um, warmly encourage the child to eat and offer foods, suggest that the child tries foods, but this is without coercion and is in, in respect to uh, the child's refusals or you know, expressed needs. Um, so this wouldn't be doing things like forcing food into the child's mouth or, or um, not being sensitive to the child's preferences or autonomy during the feeding. So let's pause a minute and summarize these ideas around the importance of responsive feeding. As we know, early infancy is a sensitive period for obesity risks, so it's a really important time to support new parents in developing their feeding interactions in a way that can um, support responsive feeding and the baby's needs to develop abilities to self-regulate intake and growth. So um, these early feeding interactions are a really important target for prevention efforts. We know that responsive feeding is, is our ideal, and during responsive feeding, the caregiver is sensitive and contingently responsive to infant feeding cues. And this is really a great way to support infants developing abilities to self-regulate in growth. All right, so let's think about now breastfeeding versus bottle feeding. What are the differences and um, how does this what implications does this have for responsive feeding? So breastfeeding is really complementary to responsive feeding in part because it's a demand and supply system. And I have demand and supply in that order on purpose. Um, we typically hear supply and demand, but really, you know, during breastfeeding, infant demand is a really important input for uh, regulating how much milk is, is produced by the breast. So infant demand is communicated to the, the mother's brain by the frequency, duration, and intensity of infant sucking. And that then communicates back to the, the breast um, how much milk should be produced. And there are increases and decreases in milk supply responsive to infant demand. So in this way, you know, breastfeeding is it's successful breastfeeding in, inherently needs to be infant led. And so we know that if mothers are initially responsive, that this really supports the establishment of breastfeeding. But then we also know that the continued breastfeeding likely bolsters responsive feeding and, and helps to develop the mother's skills as a responsive feeder. And some of the important features beyond the demand and supply, you know, regulation of, of uh, milk supply is that the mother can't easily access how much the infant consumes. So she must really rely on infant cues to access feeding adequacy, right? That's, that's really the main way she's going to know that the infant is satisfied as if the infant signals that uh, and the behaviors are aligned with that. So 
on in the idea of responsive feeding supporting breastfeeding research has shown that mothers who show better bonding with their babies during the first couple days after birth and who have higher sensitivity to their babies during the first couple days um, go on to have longer breastfeeding duration so these findings suggest that that mothers who initially have more responsiveness are more successful um, in their uh, in their breastfeeding outcomes. But we also see that mothers who breastfeed for longer durations, they, they have more responsive feeding practices later on um, when their children are one to two years of age. And so um, this likely occurs via neural and behavioral mechanisms that we know that the hormones of lactation, um, oxytocin in particular, help bonding and, and connection between the mother and baby. Uh, there's some research showing that there are actually changes to the brain that occur with breastfeeding that help mothers be more responsive to their babies. And there's probably some behavioral learning going on here too, right? That as the mom repeatedly uh, learns, responds to her baby's cues, learns her baby's cues, that facilitates her baby, her ability to be a responsive feeder during breastfeeding, but also beyond breastfeeding as the baby transitions to solid foods. So on, in contrast, formula and bottle feeding are a little different in, in ways that we'll discuss in a minute, but I wanted to first establish uh, that we see differences in growth trajectories for formula or bottle fed infants compared to breastfed infants, as well as differences in their feeding patterns. And so this means that these formula and bottle fed infants are at higher risk for overfeeding and rapid weight gain. So compared to breastfed infants, infants who are formula fed or bottle fed, they consume more at each feeding. Uh, they show a greater risk for exhibiting rapid weight gain during the first year. They gain more weight during the first two years. And there's even some research showing that later in childhood, they have poorer abilities to self-regulate their intake. So we'll think about why this might be. So there's, there's two things going on here, right? You have a difference in the milk that's being offered, breast milk versus formula, and you have a difference in how it's being offered from the breast or the bottle. So we'll talk about each one of these and what might be underlying these differences in growth that we see for breastfed versus formula or bottle fed babies. So research has shown that these comp compositional differences are likely very important. We know that Breast milk contains bioactive components like ghrelin, leptin, these hormones that regulate um, eating behaviors and growth. And these bioactive components are uh, very dynamic. You know, the, the mother's producing them in, in, the, in her body and then um, putting them into the breast milk to give to the baby. And these are things that we probably will never find a way to replicate in formula, or at least in a way that's as effective as we see in breast milk. And so um, this emerging and exciting field, but what we have seen so far suggests that, you know, these bioactive components are um, really important and probably regulating and taking growth for breastfed infants and it are just unmatched in formula. We also know that breast milk has a lower protein content and, as I mentioned before, higher free amino acid content. And both of these um, experimental work has shown likely supports healthier growth trajectories for breast milk fed infants compared to formula fed infants. But we know behavioral differences are important too. And so the act of feeding from a breast versus feeding from a bottle likely have some impact as well. And I'll, I'll talk about a lot of this research um, in the following uh, slides. Um, we know that you know, because of that demand and supply system that's inherent to breastfeeding, that both the mother and the baby really contribute to feeding interactions. It naturally promotes a more balanced interaction because you know, the mother obviously is the one kind of bringing the breast and the breast milk to, to the table, but the baby has to play an active role in latching onto the breast and um, extracting the milk. And so uh, we, observational research has shown that there is a more balanced contribution from both mom and baby, and the baby has a more autonomy in the feeding sometimes. Uh, the mother has less information and control during breastfeeding, right? She, she can't see how much is being offered. She can't see how much is being consumed. And so the, the baby can play a more active role in regulating the, the feeding in response to hunger and fullness. 
And we know there are also fewer opportunities for less desirable practices, right? You can't put juice in a breast, but you can in a bottle. You can't add cereal to a breast, but you you can in a bottle. Um, and also, you know, things like encouraging bottle emptying are just, uh, they're better facilitated by a bottle and a little harder to do during breastfeeding. So there are, there are many differences that likely um, mean that feeding from a breast can better support the baby's need to self-regulate intake and, and growth according to physiology. And so um, just to kind of dig a little deeper into here, I, I just want to highlight that, you know, we, we often turn to bottle feeding as an alternative to breastfeeding when issues arise. And a lot of features of bottles really help this, right? It makes feeding um, maybe easier for the family if, if they're struggling with breastfeeding. But many of these features of bottle feeding may increase risk for overfeeding. And, and this um, reiterates some of what I talked about on the, the previous slide, but you know, we, we know that the infant can be a passive recipient of the bottle. You can lay the baby back on, on, on his back and um, kind of just kind of give him the milk and he doesn't have to work very hard for it. Um, we also know that during breastfeeding, we have to do both non-nutritive sucking, which is kind of a, a faster initial sucking to get the milk to come down where the baby's not getting much calories. Um, but then nutritive sucking comes when the milk flows and, and the baby is getting calories. You don't get that during the bottle feeding. It's, it's all nutritive sucking. It, you know, all the baby's getting during feeding is, is calories and doesn't have those nice opportunities for breaks in the feeding when the mom switches the breast and, and you know, the non-nutritive sucking needs to um, stimulate the letdown from the second breast. Um, experimental work actually measuring you know, the, the pressure and rate of sucking during breastfeeding to bottle feeding has shown that infants can suck at a slower rate during bottle feeding and so they don't have to work as hard. There's a more efficient transfer of breast milk or formula during bottle feeding. And as I mentioned, the, the caregiver has more information and control over the feeding. The caregiver during bottle feeding is the one to determine how much goes into the bottle and can see how much leaves the bottle. And if that caregiver has concerns or preconceived notions over how much, about how much the baby should be consuming, they have a lot more ability to encourage the baby to consume more if they want the baby to consume more. And I have this photo on the slide just to kind of illustrate, you know, what you can do with bottle feeding, um, which maybe isn't desirable, but you know, we have a whole line of babies here who are being fed by two caregivers. Um, these babies have their bottles propped up on blankets. The caregivers are you know, talking to each other and not entirely in tune to their babies. And so although this is getting the job done, getting the babies fed, it's missing out on a lot of what we would hope would happen during the feeding in terms of the caregiver being holding the baby, connecting to the baby, you know, watching the baby's cues and, and making sure that there's a nice balance between um, what the, the caregiver and the bottle are bringing to the feeding interaction and the baby's autonomy over that feeding interaction. So, you know, given all this, the ideal would be that we support breastfeeding and that is so important, right? We really wanna support um, all mothers and families' abilities to, to breastfeed. Um, and so this really is the deal, but I do want to highlight that bottle feeding is often the reality, right? That we know that even if we can support families in breastfeeding, there's still a lot of bottle feeding going on. Um, and so some of these data support that, that we see that 70% of breastfed infants regularly receive express breast milk in bottles. Uh, by six months, 75% of breastfed infants are also receiving formula. And a significant proportion of U.S. infants are exclusively formula fed from birth, 16%. So bottles are still prevalent, and many of the issues that I highlighted on the previous slide are with bottles themselves. And so we do want to still, you know, we want to promote and preserve breastfeeding, but we also want to think about how we can support healthy bottle feeding, given how prevalent it is among um, U.S. families. So to recap um, these ideas around breasts versus bottles for infant feeding, we know that what and how the infant fed matters. We know that there are unique properties of breast milk that support healthy growth trajectories. So we wanna prioritize breast milk whenever possible, whether that's via the breast or a bottle. Um, but there are features of bottles that make them Although they make them an attractive alternative to breastfeeding, they may also facilitate overfeeding for certain families. 
And so although we definitely want to prioritize um, breastfeeding, promote it as much as we can, we also want to recognize that bottle feeding is ubiquitous and we can support healthy bottle feeding. So that's what we'll think about next is how can we promote responsive feeding during bottle feeding. And so one of the things that we are thinking of is, you know, if, if breastfeeding promotion is our primary prevention strategy, how can we promote responsive bottle feeding as a secondary prevention strategy? Um, how can we make sure that these families who are, you know, partially or exclusively bottle feeding are doing it in the healthiest possible way uh, to support their, their feeding needs and choices? And we see this as a really important area of research because it's, it's fairly understudied and um, families feel it that many formula bottle feeding mothers and families report that they don't feel supported in their feeding choices. Um, a striking one in five formula feeding mothers reported that they received no advice or support about feeding their infants compared to only 5% of breastfeeding mothers. Uh, in qualitative work, these bottle feeding families report that the advice and the education they receive, they feel it's inadequate. And many of them feel that it's due in part greater emphasis that's placed on breastfeeding. Um, so this means that these caregivers must rely on their own judgment or friends or families, these non-professional sources of support, which sometimes can be okay, but sometimes can be problematic if it's not evidence-based advice that they're receiving. And we see that this is especially a problem in our underserved populations like low-income Hispanic mothers within WIC. So I'm going to tell you some of the work that tell you about some of the work that we've done um, with WIC families. But I first wanted to just briefly um, describe WIC to you in case you're not. I, I'm guessing most of you are familiar with WIC, but I wanted to make sure to to um, address what WIC is before I jump into their work that we've been doing with them. So uh, WIC is the special supplemental nutrition program for women, infants, and children. This is the United States Federal Nutrition Assistance Program that really targets th these populations that are at high High nutritional risk. So pregnant and postpartum women um, and their infants and children up to five years who are low income. And so it's a, a program that really targets the sensitive period of uh, pregnancy and early childhood and make sure that these low income families are, are well fed during this period to support their um, healthy nutrition and growth. And so WIC provides uh, nutritious foods. They provide formula as well. They provide nutrition education and really great breastfeeding or support and also refer families to health and social services if needed. We know that WIC has significant reach, right? That it serves half of all infants in the United States and 6.4 million families per month. So this is, uh, WIC is a really important place to be in the, in the space of infant feeding and supporting early feeding practices. And although WIC really supports breastfeeding um, and has done a lot of, of great expansion and work in the past couple decades to increase their support for breastfeeding, um, it is still a major dispenser of formula, and we know that these low-income families are at higher risk for formula feeding. And so um, in an average month, the vast majority, 80% of WIC infants are issued infant formula. So, you know, this is a really great space for bottle feeding work because these families need this breastfeeding support, but they also need the balanced support of, of uh, bottle feeding education. And we've done some qualitative work with uh, the WIC mothers in the LA County WIC program that has shown that these mothers feel stigmatized for formula feeding. Um, they feel that their experience as a formula feeding mother within WIC is not as robust and supportive as if they were a, a breastfeeding mother within WIC. And I just have some quotes that highlight some of the themes that came out of the work that we, the focus group work that we did with WIC mothers. Um, one of the things that they that they felt judged for not breastfeeding, and this quote illustrates this, um, this woman indicated that with my son, I felt judged once I had to switch over to formula. And they would be like, well, have you tried this? I tried everything. I was just like, I can't, I stopped. And because WIC is very big on breastfeeding, that made me feel like it, I wasn't doing my job. During those times, I felt very judged. These mothers also reported that they perceive WIC as a formula provider. Um, that 
I think the breastfeeding people, breastfeeding people more and formula get less, so they just don't want to continue with the whole process. So you know, they they receive the formula from WIC, but aren't realizing how many great social benefits and you know other benefits come from the the WIC staff and the support that they can give them. These mothers also uh, reported difficulties obtaining the desired amount of formula because of WIC policies that they felt the staff was reluctant to give them formula. And although this, this mother expressed that she knew the goodness of breast milk, she still needed formula and had made that choice. And so desired that WIC supported her personal option to choose to formula feed. So this you know, qualitative work can help us I guess rethink, you know, what sorts of support we're giving for breastfeeding versus formula feeding. And, you know, if we think of what types of support are typically given for breastfeeding versus formula feeding mothers, there is often a discrepancy that to support breastfeeding, we give education about proper positioning and latching. We, um, we know that mothers have to rely on those hunger and fullness cues to determine when to feed and stop feeding. And so we really teach them those cues. We teach them the signs of a good feeding, common breastfeeding problems. Um, often these mothers are learning about pace bottle feeding to support their transition to bottle feeding in a way that will also allow them to keep breastfeeding and they have interactions with professionals who are trained to support you know their their breastfeeding with lactation consultants uh, sometimes formula feeding mothers receive this but quite often their their support and education is really focused on how much to feed how often to feed how to safely prepare the formula and how to choose the right formula and so you know if we if we think about this within a context of responsive feeding these are not really aligned with responsive feeding, right? It's really aligned with how much and how often. And so uh, that, that really give great robust support for infant led feeding during formula or bottle feeding. And so we've been asking the question of, well, can we better align the support that we give to formula feeding mothers with what we give to breastfeeding mothers to make our approaches more inclusive uh, so that they're receiving all this great information about um, proper positioning, you know, holding your baby upright so that they have to work harder during the feeding, recognizing your baby's hunger and fullness cues and letting that guide how much you feed rather than preconceived notions about how often or how much a, a bottle feeding baby should consume. What are the signs of a, a good feeding um, and common size, signs of overfeeding? We can teach them also about pace bottle feeding and why not have infant feeding consultants that can help them with their feeding problems so that they feel supported in um, getting their questions answered and, and the education that they need to be responsive bottle feeders. And I just want to highlight that, you know, although I highlighted all these risks for overfeeding during bottle feeding, we know that this isn't always the reality, that responsive feeding during bottle feeding is possible and we do see many moms who naturally gravitate to this. Uh, so I'm going to share some results from an, an experiment that we did that highlighted uh, this, this natural alignment between responsive feeding and bottle feeding that we see for some mothers. So um, we conducted an experiment where we had mothers and babies come into our lab two times and during the first visit they engaged in just a typical feeding interaction. So we said to the mom, can you just feed your infant as you normally would at home? And, um, and we video recorded the feeding and, and then coded it later for the feeding interaction, for you know what happened. And we also um, measured how much the baby consumed during this feeding. And I'll note that these were all formula feeding mothers. During the second visit, we uh, created an infant led condition. So the second visit, after we had that baseline of what their typical feeding looked like, we then had a trained research assistant who kind of moderated the feeding and said, okay, this time we're gonna wait till your baby shows these different cues um, to, to feed, and then I'll help you look for the fullness cues. And you know, when we see these different cues and we see at least three of them, then we'll, we'll stop the feeding. So the mom got a little extra support to make sure it was more of a, a infant-led feeding during this time. Um, and again, we had, we had 21 formula feeding mothers um, who participated in this study. And so, so ideally what we were looking for here then was the alignment that to, between these two um, conditions. 
how much difference was there between the typical feeding versus the infant led feeding for these these mothers and how much variability were, were there some mothers who these feedings looked exactly the same because the typical feeding was an infant led feeding and were there some mothers who were there's there's a big difference between these feedings and the baby consumed a lot more or a lot less uh, during typical feeding versus infant led feeding and so what we saw was that many, but not all, bottle-fed infants were fed more during the typical feeding versus infant-led feeding. And so I'll walk you through this figure um, before I, I tell you a little bit about what, what we saw. So um, on the x-axis here, we have the data for each infant in the study. So the infant ID is, is um, each of the different letters that you see there. So each, each bar is an individual data point. On the y-axis, oops, um, we have this percent difference for intake score, which is the um, basically a calculated score that tells you how much more the infant fed during the typical feeding compared to the infant led feeding. So the values that are um, to the right indicate that the infant consumed more during the typical feeding compared to the infant led feeding, and the values on the left illustrate the infant consumed the less. So these bars here show that these babies consume quite a bit more during that typical feeding, that they, um, their, their mothers their fed them more and there wasn't a great alignment between what happened during the typical feeding versus the infant feeding. And this was um, eight out of the 21 infants that we, we observed. But I, I also wanna highlight that many consumed about the same amount uh, during these two feedings, that 13 consumed uh, the same during the typical feeding versus infant-led feeding. So we had some you know, variability here in, in what these bottle feedings look like and whether they were infant-led versus not. And the strongest predictors of the baby consuming more during the typical feeding um, of that baby being overfed during typical feeding was how um, restrictive and responsive the mom was in her feeding style. And so we saw that mothers who reported lower levels of restrictive and responsive feeding, uh, they fed their baby much more in this typical feeding um, condition. But infant temperament also mattered here that, as well, that babies who were, um, that baby's temperament predicted the difference between these two conditions and that um, infants who were less rhythmic, less adaptable, and had more positive mood tended to feed more during the typical versus infant-led feeding conditions. So, um, so bottom line, you know, key takeaway from these data is that some babies seem to overfeed uh, during bottle feeding, and it might be partly the mom's feeding practices, partly the, the infant's temperament, but others don't. And so um, we do want to make sure to distinguish, you know, those moms who are bottle feeding well versus maybe those who need more support so that we can provide them with the support they need to reduce the risk for overfeeding. So, We've been thinking about this in a number of different ways. And, and one of the things that we've been thinking about how we can support bottle feeding families is thinking about ways that we can make bottle feeding more like breastfeeding, ways that we can maybe reduce some of the um, temptations to, to overfeed that are imposed by these features of bottles so that parents can be more attuned to their, their babies and their baby's cues and let that drive their, their feeding behaviors. And so we've done um, a series of experiments where we've looked at this um, from the focus of these bottle-based cues that are provided around how much is offered versus consumed. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, you know, one of the main differences between breasts and bottle feeding is, is how much information and control the different has over the feeding. The, the, during bottle feeding, the caregiver knows how much is in the bottle, how much leaves the bottle, and more, more uh, ability to encourage their baby to consume more if they don't feel like their baby ate enough. And so part of what facilitates this is that most families use these conventional clear bottles that is highlighted on the left here, where you know they, they can clearly see how much is in the bottle and how much leaves. So 
we did a pretty simple intervention uh, where we covered up all those cues. And so we developed this neoprene sleeve, which slid over the bottle. And you can't see in the picture, but there's actually a little bit of weight in the bottom of that sleeve. So it removes both those visual and the tactile cues around how much is in the bottle. And we were curious to see whether this simple intervention would help parents to better tune into their babies versus tuning into the, the bottle and the bottle-based cues. And so for this experiment, we had 76 bottle feeding dyads who came into our lab on two separate days. On one day, they fed their baby using the clear conventional bottle, and the other day they fed their baby using the opaque weighted bottle. And we were inter interested to see whether the feedings differed both in terms of how much the baby consumed during these two conditions, but also in terms of the um, the behaviors of the mothers and the infants. And in this study, we used the parent-child interaction feeding scale to assess uh, how sensitive the mom was to her baby's cues and um, how responsive she was to her baby's distress. We, we used all the, the subscales on that um, scale, as well as you know what the baby brought to the interaction in terms of clarity cues and responsiveness to uh, the caregiver. And so what we found when we compared these two conditions is, first of all, mothers were significantly more sensitive to their baby's cues when they used the opaque bottle compared to when they clear bottle. So the, the bottle had a significant effect on the mom's sensitivity to her baby's feeding cues. We also saw differences in how much the baby consumed. That when the mom used the opaque bottle, her baby consumed a significantly less per kilogram body weight of breast milk or formula. Uh, the baby also sled it, fed at a slower rate too. So the bottle seemed positive on both how sensitive the mom was to the baby as well as um, how much the baby consumed during the feeding. So we've also done some wider scale work with the WIC program to see if we can uh, support WIC staff in better supporting bottle feeding parents. Uh, and so we recently published this paper and I, I put it here in case you wanted to read a little more about it. Um, that we recently completed an intervention that was really focused on re uh, promoting responsive bottle feeding within WIC. And this was a policy systems and environmental change approach, meaning that we really tried to work with the WIC clinics to um, both change their culture a little bit and, and helping them to feel okay with talking about bottle feeding, um, not be worried that it would compromise their breastfeeding support, and change some of the ways that they assessed and um, educated mothers to better start and bottle feeding uh, choices. And so we had two main strategies that we employed in this intervention. The first was to revamp some of the early assessments that were being done. Uh, and in particular, in the WIC program, they do a newborn enrollment assessment where, you know, as new families enroll into the program, they assess how they're feeding and how much, you know, breastfeeding support versus formula they need. But the forms that they were using were really focused on breastfeeding, of our breastfeeding, do you need help with breastfeeding? Why aren't you breastfeeding? Can we get you breastfeeding? And so this is really great for helping, you know, those breastfeeding moms and, and getting targeted breastfeeding support. But it was probably also leading to some of what we saw in our focus group findings that I showed you previously, that these, these moms who maybe were already deep into formula feeding felt like with the WIC staff were saying, well, why aren't you breastfeeding? Can we get you breastfeeding? Good, let's talk more about breastfeeding. Um, and again, so important to, to support breastfeeding, but we also needed a, a more of a balance to make sure that these formula feeding moms were getting the intervention they needed too. So we revamped these early assessment forms so that they were a bit more inclusive and um, that they really provided a really effective foundation for tailored intervention. And so this is an example of one of the forms that we developed that is really for the formula feeding family. And we made sure that it asked about these risk factors for overfeeding. Um, like, do you encourage your baby to finish the bottle? How frequently are you feeding? And if there was a, a problem that was noted, noted in, in the participants' responses, as you can see on the very right side of the form, the WIC staff was directly linked to the proper educational material. So they could very easily you know, pull out the, the evidence-based resources that they needed to address the risk factor for overfeeding that might be occurring during these feeding interactions.
We also uh, enhanced the resources that they had to support both breast and bottle feeding. And we helped, you know, WIC already had a lot of great messaging around responsive feeding, but it was kind of being, I guess, brought into the rest breastfeeding realm and, and thought about as a breastfeeding support when really it was education that all mothers uh, could benefit from. And so we tried to contextualize some of the messages families were already getting about you know, infant cues and baby behaviors and, and contextualize them within the bottle feeding context too. So that these families who were bottle feeding saw, oh, this is relevant to me too. And um, we also developed some additional resources that were directly related to responsive bottle feeding. We rebranded the breastfeeding line so that it was an infant feeding line so that any mom could feel like she could call and get support from an infant feeding specialist um, for breastfeeding or, you know, formula or bottle feeding. We also had a um, texting campaign where we provided moms with additional support around formula and bottle feeding and linked them to resources and support. So um, this study was supposed to go for 12 months to see not only you know, uh, differences in feeding patterns and growth for these babies, but also whether it helped retention in the program for formula feeding problems. Um, but with so many things in our lives these days, it was disrupted by COVID. So we are actually only really able to get data through the first um, six months uh, before the COVID-related clo closures happened to WIC programs. We still got some data 11 months, but I'll just present um, the six-month uh, outcome data to you here. Um, and I, I don't think I mentioned this previously, but I did want to note that this uh, intervention occurred in the LA County WIC program, the uh, Public Health Foundation WIC program. And so, so we started with uh, selecting three intervention and match control sites. We trained the staff at the intervention sites, but collected data at, at both sites in terms of infant growth and, um, and mother's feeding practices. Um, and then we had a baseline assessment at the newborn enrollment, a three month and a six month assessment where we assessed all of our outcomes of interest. And the intervention itself, what I mentioned to you, uh, occurred between the baseline and, and six month assessments. And so importantly, we, we were really concerned about breastfeeding, right? We wanted to really preserve and protect the, the great breastfeeding support that goes on during WIC. And so we, we really wanted to make sure that what we were doing did not impact breastfeeding rates at our, our different clinics, and it, it did not. So we saw that um, uh, here on these figures, we've got infant age on the x-axis and the prevalence of breastfeeding in both the, um, the PSE clinics and the control clinics. And you can see that these graphs are, or these figures are, are pretty identical, that at six months, um, the prevalence of any breastfeeding was 35% in both the PSE and control clinics. And this is comparable to what we typically see at WIC. Um, so, so this was good. We didn't impact breastfeeding. And I will also note that, you know, this confirms that the vast majority of WIC families are indeed bottle feeding and, and you know, potentially benefited from our intervention. And really, in terms of our primary outcome that we were in interested in, it was a risk for these infants. And we saw that these infants who were in the intervention, the PSE clinics, had a significantly lower prevalence of rapid weight gain compared to infants in the control clinics. So these, these strategies that we implemented seem to really impact uh, risk for rapid weight gain among these WIC infants. So we saw that, um, so we, on this figure that I have here for you, we have the, the two different groups, the PSC versus control clinics, and the percent of infants in each uh, cluster of clinics who exhibited rapid weight gain. We saw only 20% of infants in the intervention clinics exhibited rapid weight gain compared to 33% in the control clinics. And this difference was significant um, that these, these infants who, um, whose families received the intervention were 64% less likely to exhibit rapid weight gain compared to infants whose families didn't receive the intervention. So, to wrap up, you know, some of these, these findings that I presented you on, on these strategies that we've been thinking about to promote responsive bottle feeding, um, bottle feeding families report feeling underserved. And so we do need more attention and research to provide evidence-based, you know, advice and support to these, these families. We need to make sure that these uh, strategies complement breast 
right? We've done, a, we've made a lot of great gains to support breastfeeding. And so we don't want to compromise that, but we do also want to meet families where they are and make sure that we're supporting healthy bottle feeding. Um, and we see this as especially important within the WIC program, given how many bottle feeding families it serves. In our research, we've seen that responsive bottle feeding is possible, and many families already do this very well. So we want to recognize, you know, use a strength-based approach to recognize these families who, who already translate these responsive feeding messages to bottle feeding well. But we've also, you know, explored some strategies that seem effective in um, promoting responsive bottle feeding and providing targeted support to, to families who need it. All right. So let's let's finish off with thinking about the baby. We've been thinking a lot about parents and you know caregivers supporting their feeding practices, but as I'm sure you all already appreciate, the babies are important to consider too in these feeding interactions, and they make an important contribution to the the outcome um, of our feeding interactions. So we do want to consider you know the the variability that we see in babies in terms of their clarity of cues and, and temperaments and how that might make responsive feeding more versus less difficult or you know make caregivers in need of targeted support to achieve responsive feeding and so we've been particularly interested in in you know looking at babies and thinking about these issues of how how do babies communicate during feeding and um, what sort of variabilities exist some of our work has shown significant associations between um, baby's consistency and clarity of cues and mother's responsiveness. Um, and so these are two different studies that show similar things. Um, on the figure on the right, on the left here, uh, we observed feeding interactions on two different days and then did behavioral coding of the the cues that babies use to signal uh, satiation and so we were able to see from these observations how consistent were these babies across two different days uh, and we saw you know that some babies were super consistent they really showed the, the same profile of cues across two different feedings and others were pretty inconsistent maybe on one day they were pretty quiet and didn't really communicate very much and the other day they they really showed a lot of cues and so this is just you know one snapshot in time of these babies but we did see that um, if we were able to develop you know a consistency score that represented how consistent versus inconsistent that baby was across those two days of, of feeding, that that was significantly associated with the mom's self-reported responsive feeding style, which is represented on the y-axis here and was measured by the infant feeding styles questionnaire. So a positive association here, which suggests the more consistent the baby, the more responsive the mother. This is cross-sectional, so we don't really know what's driving what. It could be that mothers who are more responsive, you know, facilitate more consistency on the part of the infant because they learn, oh yeah, people listen to me if I speak, so I'm gonna keep speaking. Um, but it could also be that that babies who are more inconsistent, it's, it's kind of harder to achieve responsive feeding, right? If, if your inputs are, are not as consistent and clear. Um, in the work that we've done using the PCI feeding scales, we see significant correlations here. And I know this, this probably isn't a surprise to any of you who know these scales well, um, but it, it was interesting to see, you know, in, in this context specific to looking at feeding interactions and obesity risk that we see that um, there's a significant correlation between how clear the baby's cues are and um, the mom sensitivity to, to Q score on the PCI feeding scale. So, you know, th this is, I think it's cross-sectional work, so it's preliminary. We need more research to learn more about what's driving what here, but it, it does emphasize this idea that both the baby and the mom are, are contributing here and that we need to consider the baby's consistency and clarity of cues when we think about promoting responsive feeding and supporting parents' abilities to learn their baby's cues during feeding interactions. We also see that lower clarity of cues is associated with greater uh, weight for age z-source change, but only for formula-fed infants. Um, and so this figure shows these findings here that on the x-axis, we have breastfeeding versus formula feeding infants. And we have change in weight for HD score from birth to entry into the study that we were doing. And so um, a greater change in weight for HD score would indicate um, 
you know, more rapid weight gain during this, this early window. And so we can see here that in the blue bars, these are um, breastfeeding versus formula feeding babies who have higher clarity of cues. And you can see the weight for HD score is pretty similar between these, these two groups. Um, it's, it's not significantly different, meaning that if the, the baby's clarity of cues is higher, then that baby doesn't really have differential weight outcomes if they're being breast versus formula fed. Where we really see a difference is for these babies who have lower clarity of cues. If they're breastfed, they show pretty similar weight gain to those babies with higher clarity of cues. But if they're being formula fed, we see significantly greater weight gain for these babies. And this is kind of aligned with you know, what I, I've talked about in the, the previous slides is that it may be that bottle feeding for these babies with lower clarity of cues, um, they may be at higher risk for overfeeding if they're not able to clearly signal their needs to their, their parent to facilitate responsive feeding. Um, a, a finding that I didn't show you before, but I'll, I'll highlight now within this context of thinking about the baby is that within our uh, study that we did with the um, clear versus opaque bottles, we, we you know, saw those findings that I showed you previously where these bottles seem beneficial for promoting uh, maternal response, maternal sensitivity and reducing infant intake. But we said there was actually um, an interaction between infant clarity cues and the bottle condition. And so what this figure here is showing is that if we compare, compare the clear versus opaque bottle um, and look at how much the baby consumed, the intake per kilogram body weight, the, the findings actually differ if you consider how clear the baby's cues are. For these babies with lower clarity of cues, the, the intervention actually wasn't very effective for them. They consumed the same amount regardless of whether their mom used a clear versus opaque bottle. It was really these babies who had more clear cues, higher clarity of cues, that we saw this clear effect of opaque, opaque bottles, that babies consume less when fed with opaque bottles versus clear bottles. So again, this supports this idea that uh, responsive feeding on the part of the parent may be contingent on the baby actually being able to, you know, clearly express needs. These moms might need, or these caregivers might need additional support to achieve responsive feeding when that backbone of, of clarity of cues is, is not as um, strong or, or evident for them. Um, we are also interested in this broader, you know, idea of infant temperament. Um, there's much research that's shown that temperament is associated with feeding practices and weight outcomes. And again, I, I think many of you probably um, know this idea of temperament, but it, in case you don't, it's the individual differences in emotional expression, activities, and attention regulation that we see uh, babies expressing. Um, and a lot of research in this realm has focused on negative affectivity or how fussy that baby is, the baby's propensity towards higher level of crying, fearfulness and anger, and lower levels of soothability and stimulation threshold. And previous research has shown that when you have babies with greater levels of negative affectivity, these fussier babies, they tend to get fed more because feeding is a pretty effective soothing mechanism, but it's maybe not always aligned with the baby's needs, right? So when you have this a mismatch between the soothing response, using food to soothe, and the baby's fussiness, uh, this is associated with higher risk for rapid weight gain for these babies. So these babies may be particularly vulnerable to being overfed because they're fussier and uh, their families might need additional intervention. And in the WIC-based intervention that I showed you before, we found that our uh, response to bottle feeding promotion was effective for uh, mitigating risk for rapid weight gain, we actually found that when we looked deeper at the feeding practices these moms were using, the effects of the interventions on feeding practices were really only evidence for these mom evident for these moms with fussier babies. So this intervention seemed to really um, work best for these moms who had these babies with higher levels of negative affectivity. And so I'll show you two figures that illustrate this that uh, on the x-axis for these figures, we have the infant's level of negative affectivity or how fussy that baby is. And we have low levels of fussiness on the left, moderate versus high. So the, this, these high fussy babies are what the ones that we're really focused on. 
Uh, on the y-axis of this figure, we have the frequency of use to food to soothe that the mothers reported at six months. So how often they reported that they used food to, to soothe their babies. And so we really saw differences between the intervention versus control clinics in their use of food to soothe when their babies had high levels of fussiness. So these this responsive bottle feeding intervention seemed to be most effective uh, in reducing use of food to soothe for these high fussy uh, babies. We also saw that mothers who had fussier infants um, used fewer feedings per day if they received their intervention as well. So it seemed uh, we have the mom's reported number of feedings today per day at six months, and we saw a significant you know, difference in um, the intervention versus control clinics for how frequently they were feeding their baby. And this is around you know eight feedings per day for the intervention clinic mothers versus um, eleven to ten to eleven feedings per day for the control clinic. So um, you know, full difference in how often they were feeding their fussy babies, which is important. So what's baby got to do with it? A lot, right? We know that infant clarity of cues and temperament are important considerations when we're thinking about promoting responsive feeding and that these mothers of babies with lower clarity of cues and who are fussier maybe need more targeted support to achieve responsive feeding and you know help them decipher their baby's needs despite maybe inconsistency in the cues they're receiving or just too many right so much crying and fussing and trying to decipher um how to dis how to distinguish hunger cues from other needs um, and well, what we, we've seen, promotion of responsive feeding and parenting can help these mothers with fussier babies to reduce their reliance on food to soothe and how much they're feeding their babies um, and, and reduce their risk for rapid weight gain. So this seems to be an effective way to support these mothers who may have more challenging infants. So to wrap everything up for you, and then I welcome questions, we know that infancy is a sensitive period for obesity prevention efforts um, and focusing on responsive feeding is a great way to support new families and is a really important target for our early intervention efforts. As we saw, breastfeeding and responsive feeding seem to be more complementary. So responsive feeding is still a really important thing to promote for breastfeeding families and can really support breastfeeding success, but it may be a little easier uh, to align those two, the, that mode of feeding and that feeding style of responsive feeding. So we know that responsive feeding during bottle feeding is indeed possible, but we need maybe need to give families a little extra support to achieve this. Our work has shown some promising strategies include teaching mothers about feeding cues regardless of their feeding mode, making bottle feeding more like breastfeeding may help, and in particular we've shown that removing those visual and weight cues during bottle feeding can be an effective way to increase sensitivity cues and decrease how much infants are consuming. And we also saw in our WIC based intervention that this early targeted support, effective, inclusive intervention of bottle feeding and connection of, of feeding problems to appropriate resources seems to really help uh, reduce risk for overfeeding and rapid weight gain for these formula and bottle feeding babies. But we do also want to appreciate what the baby brings to, to the table, and we need additional research to fully appreciate um, how this might impact responsive feeding and what sort of targeted support we can give to families who have babies whose uh, cues may be less consistent or clear or who have higher levels of negative affectivity. So I did want to mention that I'm just wrapping up some work on a book related to this topic. Um, and so it, it talks about a lot of what I told you about today related to responsive bottle feeding, but also digs a little deeper into responsive feeding during breastfeeding and the introduction of solid foods. Uh, the anticipated release date is August 2022, but you can pre-order now if you're interested. Uh, and it's published by Elsevier, so I have the link for you there, but it's a quick Google search away too if you're interested in reading more on this topic. I do want to acknowledge all the funding sources that supported this research. A lot of our work has been supported by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, but the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation supported our WIC work. Um, and we also have some great support through uh, various foundation and, and institute grants. So thank you all for your time and attention, and I would love any questions that you have.
Oh my God.